Thank you, worship team. Thank you all for singing out so well. Good morning, Grace Church. Are you guys you with me? Are you, all right, all right something, something happened there. Okay, all right, we're, we're back with it. All right. Well, I am so glad to be back uh, after our vacation. Uh, if you're interested, I can tell you about it offline, but uh, it was exciting, it was fun, and uh, we had some interesting moments as well. So it's good to be back. I know Eric did a great job two weeks ago, and then Noah preached uh, for us last week, and I, uh, we were able to listen to both of those messages on Facebook, and it was great to see other men sharing God's Word, teaching God's Word, doing a great job. So uh, thank, thank both of those guys for that, and uh, um, it's good to be back with you. Um, you have found a great week to come to Grace Church. We're starting a brand new series called Five Stones or Five Smooth Stones. We're going to be talking more about why five in a few weeks. But for now, we're going to be covering an entire chapter uh, in the Bible over the next four weeks. We're going to be talking about a story Probably in all the Bible stories, this is one of the top five best well-known stories in the Bible. Kids, you know this story, so it's not going to go over your head. It's the story of David and Goliath, all right? Think about with me, when was the first time you heard the story of David and Goliath? Maybe it was in a Sunday school class at church Maybe it was from mom or dad at home. For me, uh, my mom read us Bible stories at the, uh, you know, before bedtime, and I think that's probably the first time I heard the story of David and Goliath as a child. You know, my mom had those blue books that had all the Bible stories in them, and so I was able to watch, you know, or look at the pictures and uh, see how big Goliath was and how little David was, and it was so interesting. As, uh, as a parent, my kids love to hear the story of David and Goliath. Now we have grandkids, they love to hear the story of David and Goliath. Our kids even dressed up and did plays for David and Goliath and da uh, David and Jonathan and everything. But think about the first time you heard the story of David and Goliath. When you think back to that time, wasn't it, wasn't it one of those stories that was just enthralling it was like i want to know more i want to know how that happened how big was goliath how fast did the stone go you know what you know and if you're a little boy you wanted to know more about the sword and stuff all right but it's a fascinating story and whether you've known this story for hundreds of years <laughs> all right all right maybe decades more, list, more realistically, if you've known this story for decades, or maybe you've only heard this story more recently, it is a story that is timeless. It, it surpasses, you know, all the stories that we could ever hear because it is a fascinating story. The story gives us the account of God's ability to deliver his people even through a unlikely hero of David. The story begins by telling us about this challenger that's larger than life. He is the arch enemy. He is the, you know, the giant Goliath. The story begins by telling us about this giant and the narrative as we continue to read through it. We learn about not only about the enemy of Israel, but we learn about the fear of the army of Israel and how afraid they are. And how timid they are. And how the, the giant just intimidates them over and over again. And ultimately, we learn that God is able to uh, conquer even our biggest enemy. But the story is much more than the little guy can beat the big guy. Now that analogy has been used throughout history hundreds of times. You know, the David and Goliath analogy is used so much that it almost diminishes the biblical account. But the story is much more than, you know, the little guy can beat the big guy or God can defeat our biggest enemies. The story has so much more to it than just those simple truths, even though those are absolutely true. So for the next four weeks, 
I want to encourage you to look at this story of David and Goliath, even though it may be familiar, look at it with a fresh set of eyes, with an open heart of saying, you know what, I know the story, but I'm open to learning more about what's there for maybe the first time, seeing something new and fresh. If you would, open your Bibles to 1 Samuel chapter 17. It's in the Old Testament. It's before the book of Psalms. So 1 Samuel chapter 17, turn there and join me in prayer. Father, I thank you that you give us your word. You give us these stories in Scripture that are true, that are accurate, that are 100% of exactly what happened. And Father, as we look to this very familiar story, I pray that you will help us to recognize for ourselves things that enter into our lives, like fear and doubt and condemnation that sometimes come creeping into our minds from those from the outside. And sometimes those things come from our enemy, the devil. I pray that you will strengthen us, that you encourage us, that you'll encourage us to live by faith and trust in you, and that we will take a courageous stand of faith and trust in you and you alone, no matter what our circumstances, no matter what we face in this life, that we will never take our eyes off of you. In Jesus' name, amen. So like I said, over the next four weeks, we're going encumber- to cover this entire 17th chapter of 1 Samuel. Today, as I kick off this series, I want us to learn about the challenger. Who is this guy called Goliath? What is he, you know, what is he all about? What was his threats? What was his challenge? What what did he represent and what was he like? So if you would, turn your attention to verse 1 and follow along as I read. The, The verses are also going to be on the screen, right? Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. And they had gathered at Sokoth, uh, which belongs to Judah, and encamped at Soka, between Sokoth and Azekah and uh, Ephesus Damon. And Saul and the, and the men of Israel were gathered and, and encamped in the valley of Elah. And they drew up in line of battle against the Philistines. And the Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, And Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion. By the way, this is the only place in the entire scripture that that word, that phrase is used. A champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. And and he, uh, he had a helmet of bronze on his head. And he was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. And he had, a bron- he had bronze armor on his legs, and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. And the staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his, and his spear's head weighed 600 shekels of iron. And his shield bearer went before him. He stood and he shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to draw up for battle? Am I not a Philistine? And are you not servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. And if he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, Then you shall be our servants and serve us. And the Philistines said, and the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that you may that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. This passage Though it is well known, there's so much there. There is so much more that we skip over and don't understand. So I think it it behooves us to take a few minutes before we dive into the passage. And let me point out a couple of things. First, this wasn't the first time 
for Saul and the armies of Israel to come out in battle. So often we read this story and we think, oh, these guys are a bunch of rookies. They're a bunch of privates that have never seen combat. That is not true. The army of Israel has been out in battle several times with Saul as the general or as the leader. So these guys were not maybe hardened warriors, but they were surely experienced warriors to some extent. They had fought in battle. Second, there is a thing called representative warfare. And what we are seeing here is what is called representative warfare. Representative warfare was rare in the ancient Near East, but it was used sparingly. At times it was used. And what would happen, two armies would come up against each other. The generals would size each other up and say, we're going to lose a lot of men. We may beat these guys, but there's going to be a lot of bloodshed. Let's pick our champion. Let's let them pick their champion. And rather lose, you know, hundreds if not thousands of men in this battle, let's put one-on-one -on -one combat and, and that will decide the fate of this, this battle. It was used from time to time in the ancient Near East. That's exactly what we see here. Which should bring us to the conclusion, you're gonna, you just read or you saw, the armies of Israel are afraid. Why weren't the Philistines so anxious to jump into battle? It's because they were afraid too. Okay, let's not miss that. If the Philistines were all big and powerful and they knew they were going to walk over top of Israel at, at this battle, they would have, they, there wouldn't have been a uh, representative offer. They would have said, you guys, we're going out to battle. We're attacking you guys and, and you don't have any chance. We're going to run over top of you. But the Philistines are afraid too. They knew, their generals knew that, wait a minute, these guys are a formidable force. They can hold their own. We're going to lose some guys. So that there's fear on both ends. Now let's take a few minutes and let's talk about this guy, this giant called Goliath. The Bible describes him as being nine feet, nine inches tall. I don't know about you, but I think I've only met one seven-foot guy in my life. And this guy was a beanpole. I think, you know, even at my size, I think I could take him. Because he was a stick. But he was tall. You know, I could probably hit him in the kneecaps or something. You know, which were about like that high. No, I'm just, never mind like this high. This guy, I, how many of you have seen someone seven feet tall before? All right, that's tall. Take your biggest NBA basketball player, throw about 100 pounds on him, put two feet more on him, and then you have almost Goliath. Eric, would you join me on stage? Eric, thank you, Eric. I want you to see, most Bible scholars believe David was 15 to 17 years old at, the at this battle. And he was average height for an Israelite at that time, which I feel that I'm about average height, about five foot eight. I'm not, you know, that, I'm not the tallest guy in the world. But as you can tell, even in this battle, there would be no hope for me. <laughs> right? You sent me for <laughs> you're, a, you're a visual illustration. Come, come join me over here. I want you to see, step up there. And now, this chair is not two feet, all right? Does this look, if, if you are me, does this look intimidating? Okay, and add another, yes. All right, this is an intimidating sight. 
the average soldier, Israeli soldier, is looking down in this valley of Elah, and they are seeing this giant of a man, and he is not a beanpole. This guy is thick and wide, like Mr. Eric, all right? They have no physical chance. There is no human hope of victory just by the size difference. Thanks, buddy. Thank you, Eric. The sheer size is intimidating enough, okay? But I think we need to see a few other things, all right? We can't miss... That this passage in the Old Testament has the best description of what weapons of warfare were. Okay? It's the longest description of military attire anywhere in the Old Testament. Goliath's physical statue was domineering enough, but defensively, he had full body armor of bronze. Full bronze body armor. If you know what bronze is, it's copper and tin mixed together. Uh, this, this battle occurs late in the Bronze Age in the ancient Near East. The, the, just the, the attire, the armor that he has on would speak to this guy's ability not only for defensive purposes, but Think about the cost of this armor. This is all bronze. The, the, the chain mail that was made of bronze that covered weighed 125 pounds. I mean, that's approaching what I weigh. And this guy is carrying it around. Offensively, he's sporting a 10-foot javelin with an iron tip on it that has got to be almost 18 inches long. Iron, by the way, pierces bronze, all right? So this is a formidable weapon. Later, we're going to find out that he has a sword, and this sword is going to be a, a treasure for Israel for years after this battle. This, this sword weighs more than 15 pounds and is approximately four feet long. Now, you think about that. How are you, as a normal human being, able to even wield this sword? You can't do it with one hand. And yet, this is the sword of Goliath. His military equipment was state-of-the-art for the time. And it made him appear invincible, size, defensively, and offensively. By the way, only King Saul is reported to have armor in the army of Israel, uh, in the army of Israel. So you think about that. None of the none of the soldiers in Saul's army would have had even one piece of the armor that this guy Goliath has. However, and this is an important however, the Lord had just warned Samuel, which in turn, because it's recorded in Scripture, has just warned us. Don't pay undue attention to outward appearance. Because in 1 Samuel chapter 16, verse 7, we read these words. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not look on his appearance or on the height of his statue, because I have rejected him. For the Lord sees not as man sees. Man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. By the way, that verse is a double-edged sword. Man, you and I, we look on the outward appearance. We judge by what we see. That's not the way God judges. God looks at the heart. And by the way, this verse was given to Samuel when Samuel was looking at all the sons of Eli, uh, uh, I'm sorry, the sons of Jesse, and the first guy he sees is the oldest, and he's big and tall and thick, all right? By the way, this is David's oldest brother, and he does not volunteer for this, this champion. By the way, Saul, if you, if you want to know about Saul, King Saul, he was reported to being head and shoulders 
taller than all the other men in Israel. So if there was anyone that even could come close to matching up to the size of Goliath, it would have been King, King Saul or, or David's oldest brother. And neither of those two jump, jump forth. The goal for today, though, is for us to learn from, this, from the account of Goliath and apply what we see in Goliath to our own present-day enemy, the devil. Now, I know that oftentimes we are our own worst enemy, but we have an enemy that is true and real, and his name is the devil. The Bible says that the devil is, a prow is prowling around like a roaring lion, seeking someone to devour, and that's exactly what he is doing today, and that's what Peter tell told us in 1 Peter 5, 8. We have to be aware of what our enemy looks like, what his tactics are, how he challenges us, how he discourages us. In warfare, you have to study your enemy. And we have a spiritual battle going on in our lives and around us, and we need to know what our enemy is like. And that is the goal for today. If we're going to have any success in defeating opposition and persecution in our lives as a, as a follower of Jesus, we better know the tactics of our enemy. So the first thing I want us to see about Goliath is that the enemy will question. The devil will question. Goliath questioned. Notice that the very first thing that Goliath did when he walked down into the valley, he shouted up, to the Israelites, and he says, why have you come out to draw up for battle? He's questioning them. There is so much that we could read into what does he mean by that question. There's so many possible implications that we could probably draw from this. You know, why are you coming out here to fight us? You know, by the way, who is the aggressor here? Did Israel go out? No. The Philistines went into Judah. The Philistines are the offensive. They are the ones that were on the attack. And Israel is there to defend themselves. Sounds sort of like what we had go on in October 7th. Israel was not the offender. They were the defender. And that's exactly what we have here. The Philistines, by the way, that's exactly where Gaza is, is Philistine territory. So modern, ancient parallel, yeah, there's a real close parallel between this story of David and Goliath and what happened in October. Look what happens. The very first thing that he challenges them with is doubt. I am sure that when he asked them this question, that through the ranks of the Israeli army, they thought, yeah, why are we out here? And yeah, why did we come out here? Oh, because King Saul told us to come out here. The general told us to come out here. Why are we doing, what are we doing out here? Are we going to be able to beat these guys? You know, there, there was all kinds of doubts that probably drew into the minds of these soldiers that had already won many, many battles. I don't know if you struggle with doubt or not. I think whether it's for a little while or for a season, most of us battle doubt in our lives. Amen? We do. We have a human tendency to doubt ourselves, to doubt others, and at times doubt God. God are you there? Are you listening? Do you care? Do you see what's going on? Do you see the injustice? We doubt as a human nature. There's been times in my life that I've doubted whether God is working in our lives. Sometimes those doubts lasted for weeks, if not months. And when those doubts come, it's because I've got my eyes off the wrong person. I've got my eyes on the circumstances. 
rather than the one who holds the circumstances in his hands. And I want to challenge you with that as well. I don't know what you're going through in your life. I know some of your stories. I know some of the things that some of you are facing. We all face difficult and hard situations in our lives. But one thing that we should never do is doubt the goodness of God. Doubt, doubt the love of God. Doubt the concern that God has for us as his children. We should never doubt that. And even though it's a human nature, it's not our spiritual nature. Because our spiritual nature immediately turns to the Lord and says, Lord, I don't get it, but I know you do. Reality, the reality is this. We all tend to naturally gravitate towards doubt. The devil is the master of creating doubt in our lives. He constantly plants Seeds of doubt in our minds, in our circumstances, which leads us to question the goodness of God and the love of God. And by the way, this is not a modern day tactic of the devil. This is exactly what he did in Genesis 3. In Genesis 3 verse 1, we read these words. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. And he, the serpent, said, which is, by the way, the devil said to the woman, did God actually say, there's the doubt, you shall not eat of every tree in the garden? Did God actually say that? There's doubt. And Eve began to doubt. Adam began to doubt. Because there's more questions that the serpent gave, and every one of them led to another direction of doubting God. Well, you know that as soon as you take of this tree, you'll be like God. Do you know that? More doubt being cast into the minds of Adam and Eve. And that's exactly what he does to us. It doesn't matter what your circumstance, that's exactly what the, Satan does to us. He asks a simple question that creates doubt. He puts a simple situation in our lives that creates doubt. And then we wonder, God, are you there? God, do you care? God, do you see? God, do you love me? We have to be aware of his tactics. You know, in warfare, if a tactic works, why abandon it? If it works for every enemy that you come up against, Keep using the same tactic. And that's exactly what Satan does. It doesn't matter whether you're rich or poor, male or female. Doubt is a real thing that Satan will bring into your life to cause you to wonder about God. In the case of Goliath, can't you just see the Israelites and all their heads dropping, you know, when Goliath shouts out this question? They're probably thinking to themselves, you know, he's right. What are we doing out here? We're wasting our time. No one can defeat this guy. We can't defeat him. No one can. No one has a chance against his armor, his size, and his weapons. There's no way anyone can beat this guy. What are we doing out here? And if you want to hear something really wild... Their assumption was 100% correct. No one, no human being would be able to defeat this guy. And they were right. But here's the problem. God was not asking them to defeat Goliath in their own strength. God never asks us to go into battle in our own strength. It is a spiritual battle, and we read in Ephesians chapter 6, our weapons are not of this world. They are not of human ability or strength. And very soon, there will be an unlikely candidate, a warrior, that will show up on the scene, and he will defeat the Goliath, but it is not in his own strength. It is not in his own power. It is because he trusted the Lord. And we can't miss that. That will be next week. And the next week, so we would have to come back. 
Some of us have allowed discouragement and doubt to slip into our hearts because we have the wrong perspective of the battle. The Bible makes it clear that we're never meant to fight our enemy in our own strength. And every time we try it, we lose. We lose every time. I don't know about you, but when it comes to physical problems, challenges in my life, I think I'm pretty competent. Maybe that sounds pretty arrogant. I can battle through, you know, a physical problem. But I'll be honest about this. Every time I have a spiritual problem, every time there's something spiritual going on and there's a battle spiritually going on, and every time I step in and try to do it my own way and my own thinking, I create a mess. I create a mess, and, and God usually does the impossible and says, get your hands out of here. I, I've got this. Leave it alone. You're trying to make it, you know, work out in your own mental ability or experience or, you know, your own intellect. And you're just making a mess of it, Tim. Let it, let it go. I'll take it. And then when I do that, God works the impossible. Maybe that's just me. Maybe you've never experienced that yourselves. But that's been my pretty much life story. If it's a spiritual battle and I try to work it out on my own, I usually make a mess of it. When we receive doubts of the evil one, we need to respond in faith, not in fear. And that's exactly what Joshua 1.9 said. You think about the book of Joshua. And it, you kids know the story. The children of Israel leave, leave Egypt. They come into the promised land. They they walk around there for 40 years. They send in spies, and the spies come back, and 10 of the spies say, this land is filled with giants and walled cities, and we can't do it. Two guys, Joshua <coughs> and Caleb, say, no, we can't, but God can. And the majority ruled. And for 40 more years, they wandered in the wilderness. Finally, Joshua chapter 1 they're about to enter into this, this place of walled cities and giants. And the very first promise that God gives Joshua and the people of Israel is, do not be afraid, do not be discouraged. The Lord your God will be with you wherever you go. You see, when we get our focus on the enemy alone and not on the Lord, we can be intimidated. We can be discouraged. It's interesting that right after Goliath asked that question to the Israelite army, he made a profound statement that's so easily missed. He said these words, Am I not a Philistine, and are you not servants of Saul? Which brings me to the second point, which is the enemy will condemn. Basically, what Goliath was doing was he was identifying himself with the warrior people, the warrior nation of the Philistines. Am I not from the nation of the battle-hardened Philistines? And you're only servants of Saul. What was he ignoring? Now, this Philistine, this Goliath, he knew his history. He knew what had happened. He had known and they had talked about for years about these Hebrew people that left Egypt as Egypt was crying, get out of here, leave our country because of the ten plagues. They knew about the ten plagues and what their God had done. They knew about Pharaoh and his army drowning in the Red Sea. They knew of the Philistines and Goliath had known how that the Hebrews had defeated all the Canaanite nations as they came in with Joshua. Just one nation after another, after another, after another. They were clicking them off. These Philistines, they knew how hardened they were in battle. The, the Israelites were in battle. But they also knew how great his God was. And by the way, this Philistine was from the city of Gath. 
Do you remember what the guy named Samson had done in the city of Gath not too many years before? He had crushed them. And his God, the Hebrew God, had crushed the Philistines like never before. In Samson's last, last hurrah, he took down more people in that last thing than he had done in his entire life. These Philistines and this Goliath, he was discounting everything religious and everything righteous about the Hebrews. And that is exactly what our enemy does to us. He does exactly the same things. By the way, we may never, never, never forget who our God is, what He has done, what He promises to do in our lives. So in a real sense, what Goliath was seeking to do is he was elevating himself and he was devaluing these Hebrews. And from a sheer on paper, let's, look, let's put it up there. Goliath was a giant the Israelites were all of average size. Goliath had full armor, and for the most part, the soldiers of the Israelites had no armor. Goliath had multiple weapons. Most of the weapons of the Hebrews, each of them carried a sword or a sling or, you know, a bow. None of them had multiple weapons. Goliath had years of experience. We'll find that out a little bit later in this story. He's been a battle-hardened warrior from the time that he was young. And most of them that were in battle were, had minimal experience. Goliath had all kinds of confidence, and the Hebrews were intimidated. So on paper, Goliath clearly has the advantage. The enemy clearly has the advantage. If you think you can do battle against the devil... I'm going to be generous and say, you need to have your head examined. He's got thousands of years of experience of defeating a lot bigger people, a lot smarter people, a lot better people than you and me. And he's taken them all down at times. He can defeat us if we do it in our own strength. May we never forget that. He was extremely confident that he could take these guys and that is a clear tactic of the evil one in our lives. Goliath was speaking about the Israelites as if they were nobodies. You're no one. You're just following Saul, just a mere man. The devil will do the same thing to you. Well, you're just a Christian at Grace Church. You're a nobody. You can't take me. I can defeat you every day with my hands, both hands, tied behind my back. That's what Satan says to us. And on the paper, he's right. But we don't, we don't take him on on our own. A few minutes ago, I spoke about doubt. But here I want to talk about trust. If we remove everything from your life, all your money, all your possessions, your family, what are you going to have left? What are you going to have left? I hope you're going to have the same thing that I have. It's a trust in a living God who loved me, who died for me, who brought me into his family and wants to do some incredible stuff in me and through me. That's all when it really, when you strip everything away, that is all we have. And that's enough. The difference between the perspective of the Israelite army and the perspective that David had was trust. That was the difference. You're going to see that next week and the following weeks. That the Israelites didn't, they, they weren't trusting in their weapons. They weren't trusting in their Lord. They were, they were doubting everything. And David said, with God, we can, I, we can take him. And had no doubt and no fear in our lives. What kind of perspective do we have when we receive questions? When we hear the voices of condemnation, that you're a nobody. That you're only a single Christian and you're not a very good one at that. 
when you hear those words, do you trust the Lord and say, I need to go back to the truth? Often the Lord, will eat, uh, the Lord won't do this. The Lord will bring us to mind his goodness and the truth. But what Satan will say is, you're not a Christian. You're not a very good Christian. Matter of fact, I don't even think you are a Christian. Because of the way you act, the way you talk, the way you think. You can't even be a Christian because that's exactly what he did when he faced uh, God about Job. The tactic is no different. And yet we go back to the truth, no, God is good. He loves me. I've trusted him as my savior. Those things are true and certain, and I go back to what's true and certain, not to words of condemnation that are not, not true. The dialogue between Goliath and Israelite army comes as a temporary close in chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 11. Because we read the words that when Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. You want to know the vernacular? They were trembling in their boots and wetting themselves. They were afraid. And what we can't miss is this is number one of day and there will be 40 days of this. For 30 more, nine more days, this Goliath will come down and shout these same words to the Philistines, uh, uh, from the Philistines to the Israelites. He will do this for 40 days. And each time, those shouts of condemnation and questioning and series of doubts will just grow bigger and bigger and bigger into the minds of the Israelites. Which brings me to the final tactic that the evil one has, and our enemy will strike fear. When internal doubt and external condemnation come, ultimately they will lead to fear. And that's exactly where Satan wants us. He wants us to be afraid. Why do you think scary movies always have some kind of demonic overtone to them? Because he wants us to be afraid. One of the things that if we go to Scripture, and every time you go to encounters with God, we read words like we read in, in Joshua 1.9. Do not be afraid. Do not be dismayed. Trust in me. When the Apostle John, in the book of Revelation, falls before the angel and he's trembling. The angel says, stand up. Don't fear me. When we approach the Lord, we approach him with reverence. And a reverence type of fear. But not a trembling fear. We don't, we don't serve a God who is scary. He is awesome and he is powerful. But he's also a loving father who says to his children, come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden. I've already talked about what the devil wants to distract us. I've already talked about how he wants to create doubt. But one of the most prominent things that he likes to use is fear. He wants to strike fear in us. I want to be very personal here. A couple of years ago, it was two years ago this fall, I was in a bad place, spiritually, emotionally, because Renee had con contracted COVID. She spent two weeks in the hospital. The hospital wouldn't let me see her. Half the time, they wouldn't even give her the phone. I didn't know what was going on. Human Tim wanted to go in there and tear things apart. I was, I was afraid and I was angry at the system because I was afraid I was going to lose my wife and there was not a thing I could do about it. I wasn't even going to be able to say goodbye to her. I wasn't going to be there at the bed when she passed away. And it was, for those of you who know, it was close. 
She was close, really close. And I'm being transparent because that's not what I should have been thinking. I shouldn't have been so afraid. I should have been much more trusting in the Lord. I should have done what I could do and give the rest over to the Lord. But I didn't do that. Maybe you're the same way. When we get afraid, we do crazy things. We say crazy things. We do things that we would never otherwise do. And that's exactly where Satan wants us. He wants us behaving like some crazy person. And my goodness, I wanted to be a crazy person. When I walked into the Sherman Hospital, uh, two guards came beside me. They didn't know that I didn't want to tear things up, but I was quite afraid. I don't know when the last season of your fear was in your life, but I guarantee you this, it was not from God. He is not the one that caused it. Satan is the one that was instrumental in creating the circumstances for us to be afraid. Fear often tries to keep us from stepping out in faith. By the way, that we have a New Testament story that is very clear about that. You know the story about Peter stepping out in the water, walking on the water? Most of us know that story. What we don't know is the verses right before that. Matthew, 20, Matthew 14, we read these words. But the boat, by this time, was a long way from the land, between, beaten, by, beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, he, that's Jesus, came to them, walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified. Not because of Jesus, but because of their own insecurities. And they said to one another, it is a ghost. And they cried out with fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them, saying, take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. When the Lord steps into the most fearful situation, he's calling us to not be afraid, to trust him. That's exactly what we need to do. And the problem that the Israelites had that day, so many years ago, is the same problem that we face when we face our enemy. We're listening to the wrong voice. See, the Israelites were listening to the voice of Goliath. They should have been listening to the voice of God. Whose voice are you listening to? So as I conclude this message, I want to ask you a few pointed questions. Consider this week, how are you relying on your own strength and resolve in your spiritual battles? Think through some areas where you know you need to ask the Lord for help and not depend on your own strength. Try to recognize the voices of doubt, condemnation, and fear that might be thrown at you this week. And remember, those voices are not from God. Those questions those doubts are not from the Lord. And finally, spend a little extra time in God's Word because we learn to recognize God's voice by reading God's Word. We know God's voice because we know God's Word. And as we know God's Word, we consider, we hear His voice and we know His voice. Maybe consider reading the book of Ephesians or Colossians and highlighting or writing down all the ways that God promises to bless and work in our lives. Because he is the great high priest. He is the one that we can trust, even in the worst circumstance. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you that this story, though it's old and though it's so 
well known. So often we miss so much of it, what's there. Father, we know Goliath was a real person, but he represented the evil one in our own lives, in our own enemy. His tactics are no different than the tactics that Satan has hurled at us. I pray that you will challenge us. When doubt, words of condemnation, fear come into our lives, to hear your still small voice of love and truth. In Jesus' name, amen. As we prepare our hearts for